Hello everyone and welcome to this introduction to reading literature. So in this course on American literature one thing I hear from students regularly is well why bother with reading? Why is this important? Why is this relevant? And largely reading gets a bad rep. Uh, a lot of people feel that it's too much work, it's too much effort and I can certainly understand that and there are times in my life when I've certainly felt that way. In fact when I learn when I have to learn certain things that I'm not interested in and I need to read, I'm not a big fan either. But in this mini lecture, I, I'm just going to kind of give you an introduction to what reading literature is about. And I really want to kind of start with a good example of the importance or the significance of reading. And in particular, I'm going to look at the Christian Bible. And this is not necessarily a religious discussion or a dig or anything like that, but this is merely taking note that in the world today, there are over 41,000 Christian denominations. That is, f over 40,000 different Christian subsects, all of which believe in the Bible in some way, shape, or form. But those 41,000 different denominations are off really offering up 41,000 different interpretations of the Bible. So that means they're try e each one is looking at the Bible, reading it, and saying, this is how I understand the Word of God. And what we have to understand is that this act of reading, while it may seem very basic and can even seem very boring, something can come of it that, that's extraordinary. In this case, we can see over 41,000 different groups saying, no, 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 this is what's right about the Bible. And we see this with all sorts of things. Look at the political debates and how many people will want to chime in on the true interpretation of our Constitution, the true interpretation of you know, the Ten Commandments, the true interpretation of this document or that document. And I think it's an important thing to be aware of and through a course like this to really get the skills to participate in that discussion, to understand what are those differences between those denominations, between the different camps about how you interpret the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution. So one thing we, we grapple with in this course is this idea of authorial intent in reader reception, right? So what is authorial intent? Authorial intent is the author's purpose should be the sole basis for understanding and exploring a work. That is, author people who believe in authorial intent are saying, well, this is the author's one and true meaning, this is what the author has said, or this is what we can clearly deduce from the author. And that's a, you know, that's, that's a very popular view, that the person who creates it is, of course, the person who should have the say in it. But we don't entirely buy that view. We don't entirely believe that view in our culture. The best example of authorial intent we can look at is Shakespeare, right? And this idea of he is the author, and he meant certain things with his, with his you know, large range of of plays and everything else that's done with Shakespeare is people just, you know, doing interpretation that isn't really there, right? Many students will say, is that really what Shakespeare meant? And they're trying to get at this idea of, is this really the author's intent or is this just an instructor, you know, making gestures at meaning? The other idea that we have, reader reception, is this idea that the reader plays a pivotal role in making sense of and explaining a text. That is, without the reader, a work is non-existent. So what, what this perception says is it doesn't matter what the author's intent is. It's what the reader's understanding and making sense of. And so these two ideas, authorial intent and reader reception, they battle back and forth. And that's a lot of what we see in discussion and debates around well, around literature, but also around things like speeches. Look at any time the president or any other iconic figure gives a speech, and you will see people saying, well, this is what he meant. Well, this is how I interpret it. And that's a lot of what we do here in, in this course, is we look at intent and we look at reception. And we have to understand that both are important. We should understand what the author was intending. But that doesn't necessarily mean the author got it right, or that that's the sole way of appreciating or experiencing a piece of work. That the reader brings a lot of meaning, brings a lot of ideas and ways of making sense of what the author did. A great way to understand this, or to see this, is 
the, you know, a, a good example of this is fan fiction. And for those not familiar, fan fiction is when, you know, an author has created a work, Harry Potter, Twilight, Star Wars, Star Trek, and the fans, that is the readers, decide to write fiction based upon those characters. Now, if somebody's writing fan fiction about Harry Potter, clearly they're writing it from how they understand Harry Potter, not how J.K. Rowling understands Harry Potter. And so that's one way, that's a, it's an easy example to understand this, this battle back and forth between what the, the author intends versus how the reader makes sense of it. And that brings us into this idea of reading, and really there's three means of reading a text, reading something. And when I say a text, I, that could be, you know, a speech, that could be a, an actual writing, that could be a movie. Um, really, I'm talking about just how we interpret, how we make sense of. So the first is the preferred, and that's that authorial intent. That is, you read a text in the way in which the author intends. So you read the story and you agree, you, uh, you understand, you appreciate the, the message, the moral, the theme of the story. Oppositional is reading against what the author intends or challenging the ideology and the worldview of the text within the text confines. So when you read an opposite, when you read with an oppositional, oppositional mindset, what you're really trying to do is identify the ways in which the story doesn't represent necessarily what the author intends. Uh, a, a good example of this is, you know, an oppositional reading of the Constitution, at least the original Constitution, is to say, you know, is to look at it and say, well. You know, the, the original writers of this create this thing called the three-fifths rule. And the three-fifths rule is essentially saying that, well, slaves don't count as humans, or they only count as three-fifths of a human. And that goes, or that flies in the face of what the Constitution is creating, especially around the Bill of Rights and the ways in which individuals are supposed to be free. And so reading that, you can say, well, you know, it's, it's nice that this is what the authors intended, but really, they're lying or you know they're misrepresenting what it is they're actually creating and then finally we have the negotiated um, the negotiated reading and in this case you're trying to do or the, the reader is doing both it is understanding what the preferred reading is but also understanding how there are oppositional elements or other ways of reading the text that show uh, a, a disconnect with that author authorial intention and so this leads us into, you know, this idea of reading, this idea of, of trying to make sense of it. It really brings us into this idea of dialoguing a text. And all I mean by this is looking at a text as a conversation. Many students will sit down and read a book and think it's a one-way communication. Okay, I have to sit down, I have to read these 20 pages, and I will just try to, you know, take it all in and not think about it, but just absorb it. But that's not what reading really is. Reading is a dialogue. You have to remember that reading is always active. It's you taking somebody else's words and thinking about them, engaging with them, not just deciding or accepting it blindly. And you want to treat reading like a mystery, right? In the mystery, you're always asking, who did it, right? Who done it? That's the question we all want to know. So here, you want to treat a reading like that. You want to constantly be questioning, why did the author say this as opposed to that? What is the author trying to get at? Is the author trying to lie to me? Is the author trying to fool to me? Uh, you know, is trying to fool me? Is trying to misdirect me? Is trying to make me laugh? Is trying to manipulate me? What is the author trying to do to me? Right? That's the mystery because the author is writing something to which you are reading, and so there's a relationship going on, and you want to get at the, you want to get at the at the the foundation of what that is. So in that regard, all elements are suspect until proven otherwise. This is particularly true in fiction. You always want to be asking why? 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 Why is, you know, the why is the clothing that color? Why is this set in this season? Why is the character saying this to that person? Why are these two people related or why are these two people in love? You always 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 want to question what is being offered up to you. Don't just take it like it's a buffet and you know you can happily enjoy it without thinking. You want to be suspect of everything you're reading. Always think about names, relationships, interconnections among characters, objects, places. This is again true in fiction, but even in nonfiction, you want to be thinking about how the th how 
items in a text are arranged so that you can better analyze them and make sense of them. Be constantly trying to read between the lines. You're going to want to make all sorts of hypotheses. You want to challenge assumptions. You want to underline that you, you want to undermine the narrative. And when I say make hypothesis, I really want to emphasize here, you're going to make a lot of guesses, right? If you're, if you're actively dialoguing a text, you're going to make a lot of guesses. And I'm going to tell you right now, 95% of them are going to be turn out wrong. And I speak from my own experience. I am an avid reader. I read hundreds of books every year. And I'm constantly doing this. And I'm constantly wrong. And that's OK. You're making hypotheses. You're interacting. This is a mystery, as I said. So you're going to be wrong at times. That, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, what I hope within this course and in your own reading is that you, know, you maybe move from being 5% wrong to 6% wrong, or I'm uh, sorry, from being 5% right to 6% right or 7% right, that you're going to constantly be wrong. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's you're trying to figure out what, the thi what is going on before you get to the end. Who or what should you be taking from this? And what is, where is the author trying to lead you? And then finally, you should be coming up with larger meanings for everything you read, even if you're wrong. It's part of the process. There's nothing bad about trying to figure something out and not coming up right with it. The more you read, the more you actually do this process. And you can do this process, as I said, you know, for, for literature, you can do it for films, you can do it for any kind of uh, information that is coming at you. And it's okay to be wrong. The idea is to keep playing the game. So something to kind of think about within this, or I'm just going to give you a little tool here to be thinking about um, how to make sense of or how to find symbols within a text. So this would be a sound argument for legitimate symbols. The first is to identify a particular si symbol or decide that something within the, within the story, within the text, is a symbol. And that can be an object. It can be movement. It can be a person. It can be a color. You know, it can be some kind of action. Um, you know, it really can be anything. But if you see something and you feel like, gee, that, that seems more, you know, I'm reading this story and it, this, this bird keeps taking flight, right? It's identifying something and trying to figure out what the value, right? Indicate that something within the story is more than face value, right? That's not just a bird in the story. It's something more. It, it seems like it's something more. So then you try to figure out how how a symbol represents something else, right? So what does this symbol stand for? What's behind the bird? And you do this by connecting it to previous texts. Or this is one way you might do it. Where else have I seen birds? What other stories have birds in them? Well, I know there's Alfred Hitchcock's famous film, The Birds, in which birds come and kill everybody. That might not be the story that, that makes sense here. Maybe I want to try another story. What other stories do I know that have birds in them? Well, there's Johnston, Jonathan Livingston Siegel, there's the White Heron. Hmm, these are stories in which the bird represents power, represents flight. Illustrate the ways it works or can be interpreted. So I've got this bird, it's in this story, and every time the character you know, looks to the bird, the character's always thinking about freedom. Right, so you, you want to explore relationships. You want to see if there's the ways in which you can interpret what that symbol means. And then you want to say why, or you want to try to figure out why. You want to say, well, if I, if I connect the symbol to an element per moment story, uh, person in the story, then hopefully that can highlight you know, what the connection is, what the meaning is, why that bird represents freedom. Well, if we look at birds, they fly, right? That, that is a freedom that humans don't have. They cannot take to the sky except on those, you know, except on planes. And that, if anybody's ever traveled on a plane, that feels like anything but freedom. And so you want to be able to explain how the symbol enhances, alters, or shifts the meaning therein. That is, by knowing the bird represents freedom, how does that enhance our understanding of the story? All right, so that's all for this mini lecture. Um, I hope you've taken some ideas from this. Feel free to post them, you know, post your responses and the discussions uh, within the course, and let me know if you have questions. Thank you.